Suppose you had to solve an equation like x plus the natural logarithm of x equals 3. Ideally, you would rearrange it somehow. Maybe eliminate the logarithm, but then that still leaves a factor of e to the x. No matter which way you cut it, it is impossible to express the solution exactly via some elementary functions, and therefore also impossible to calculate the numerical answer directly. Very quickly, just in case you're watching this video during an exam and need to solve a similar transcendental equation. Firstly, that's very cheeky, but I would recommend rearranging it so that you have x on its own on the left-hand side and whatever else move to the right-hand side. In this case, 3 minus the natural logarithm of x. After making an initial guess, you can then use this as an iterative formula. A new value of x on the left-hand side is obtained by making calculations on the right-hand side from the old value of x, then just rinse and repeat. This can be done easily on a calculator by setting it up so that the old x is the ANS function, that is, the answer to the previous iteration, and then just pressing the equals button repeatedly. Starting with x equals 3, after a while it will approach the true solution, bouncing around the correct value. Since it is oscillating up and down, you could try being clever and take the mean of two subsequent iterations to get even closer to the true solution much more quickly. The problem is that this method will not always solve every equation, and it will generally be quite slow in converging if it does, so it's time to go back to the drawing board. We have all the terms in x on the left-hand side. Let's just group that into a single function, f of x, and a constant on the right-hand side. Let's call it y. We need to find the inverse function, f to the minus 1, such that f to the minus 1 of f of x is just x, and then we apply f to the minus 1 to y. Actually, rather than finding a solution directly, it is better to rearrange things by subtracting y from both sides, leaving 0 on the right-hand side. Then the aim is to find the roots of what is on the left-hand side. If you remember, this is what you're doing when you solve a quadratic equation, for example. For the rest of the video, let's consider the original function to be f of x. This is x plus the natural log of x in our example, but can be whatever. And f of x minus y to be g of x y is 3 in our example, but can be whatever. So, we need to find the roots of g of x. My go-to algorithm for this kind of problem is Brent's method. It is generally the fastest way to find the root of a function, provided that you can specify an interval in which the function has exactly one root. I'll talk more about this in a bit, but in the context of our original function f of x, this would mean that it is a one-to-one -one function, meaning that there is precisely one value of x which solves for a particular value of y. Conversely, if there were multiple roots of g of x, this means that the original f of x is a many-to-one function. Okay, so assuming you do only have a single root in an interval of x from a to b, Richard Pierce Brent has a few tricks to help you find it. First of all, it's possible to move to the halfway point in x and evaluate the function there. Based on its sign, the root is then either to the left or to the right of this point. This is said to be a bisection of the original interval. This method can then be repeated ad infinitum, just like Achilles and the tortoise, or at least until the interval is small enough to be suitable. However, it can take quite a while to get as close to the root as you might like. That's why the method has a second approach, called the secant method. If the function has been evaluated at a pair of points, it's possible to imagine a straight line between them and calculate where it intercepts the x-axis. This is the value of x where the function should then be evaluated again, and the process can be repeated. However, this choice may be suboptimal under certain conditions, in which case Brent's method will default to using the tried-and-true bisection method. And finally, once the function has been evaluated at three distinct points, it's possible to uniquely thread a sideways parabola through them. That is to say, having a curve where x is quadratic in y. Then, the function should be evaluated again where this curve would intercept the x-axis. 
This is called inverse quadratic interpolation. This is the preferred way to find the next value of x to use. But once again, the overall method will fall back to either the secant method or bisection if certain conditions are not optimal. Different implementations of Brent's method make slightly different decisions for when to use bisection versus the other two methods. But these are the three basic ingredients in any implementation. Overall, with each iteration, x gets closer and closer to the root of the function. As I mentioned, you absolutely must specify an interval containing just a single root for this method to work. This can be an advantage if the function has multiple roots, because it allows you to concentrate on an interval that contains a root of a particular physical interest, for example. You could likewise adopt a divide and conquer strategy, where you do multiple intervals in turn, or possibly in parallel. On the other hand, defining such an interval can be challenging and requires some thought. You can often bracket the target function with other, more simple functions. To explain this, let me plot some curves. First, let's look at where y equals our original f of x, which was x plus the natural log of x. The solution will be found where this curve crosses the line y equals 3. Now, let's consider the fact that when x is greater than 1, the natural logarithm of x becomes positive. On the other hand, log of x grows slower than x itself. This means that x is less than x plus the natural log of x, which is in turn less than 2x. On the graph, this means that the lines y equals x and y equals 2x bound our function from above and below. These lines in turn cross the line y equals 3 on either side of the solution we are seeking, giving us a nice interval in which to look. Therefore, for the example in this video, when finding the roots of f of x minus y, as long as y is above 1, we can take y over 2 and y as the interval and let Brent's algorithm sort out the rest. You can often use the same idea to bracket most other functions. At other times, you can logically deduce an interval where the solution must lie from some physical system which you are solving for, and I'll give an example of that in a moment. In Python, you can use the brentq function from the scipy library to quickly compute an inverse function. Assuming that you have the original function coded up as f and have defined a pair of bounds, you can pass them to brentq as follows. Here, the lambda function turns f of x minus y into g of x, a function with a single argument, as I explained before. Then, Brent Q quickly returns the value of the inverse function. In our case, we were finding the roots of x plus the natural log of x minus 3 in the interval from 1.5 to 3. The solution, which is accurate up to the limit of double precision floating point numbers, or something like 15 decimal places, took seven function evaluations, first making two steps with the secant method, and then three steps with the quadratic method. You can, of course, just use Brent Q to find the roots of a function without this lambda business, if you so wish. There is also the Brent H function, which replaces the quadratic interpolation step with hyperbolic interpolation instead. But I'm old school, so I only use the quadratic one. In a more performant language like C++, you can pass g as a function pointer to a ready-made solver, or integrate the function evaluation into the solver directly if this helps performance somehow. Brent's method for root finding is particularly interesting to me because of its application to plasma physics. Imagine you had a container with helium gas inside. If the gas is heated to thousands and then millions of degrees, it will become ionized into a plasma of positively charged atoms and negatively charged electrons. We can characterize the plasma by its ionization fraction, the expected number of free electrons per atom. Helium is a noble gas, so at room temperature pretty much every atom is on its own and has two electrons orbiting it. The ionization fraction is effectively zero. As the temperature is raised, so too will the ionization fraction. It will eventually reach a half, for example, meaning that many of the atoms are still not ionized, but some will have lost one electron, and a small proportion would have lost both electrons. The ionization fraction will then continue to rise, approaching 2 asymptotically. I will call the ionization fraction here x, because that is what we are trying to solve for in the way that I've been talking about. 
In general, any element or mix of elements will become a plasma when heated to sufficient temperatures. Assuming that the plasma has time to reach a state of equilibrium, that conditions do not change very rapidly, the ionization fraction is a function of the types of constituent atoms, of their density and of the temperature. For a particular choice of these parameters, this is a great problem for Brent's method to solve. It has a single unique solution. For the ionization fraction, the number of free electrons per atom, the strict lower bound is zero, the case where none of the atoms are ionized, and the upper bound is the total number of electrons in that atom. One for hydrogen, two for helium, three for lithium, and so on. As we have seen, atoms in different states of ionization are present in different proportions in the plasma. Let's label these proportions with the letter N, and then a subscript for the number of times that group of atoms has been ionized. The ionization fraction is then a weighted sum over these fractions. 0 times the proportion of neutral atoms, N0, 1 times the fraction of once ionized atoms, N1, and so on. We can form another equation by observing that all these proportions must sum to 1, a kind of normalization condition. Finally, we have the bit where the physics come in. I won't derive it here, but the Saha equation is relevant. After a little rearranging, on the left-hand side is the ratio of any two adjacent ends. On the right-hand side, we have the ionization fraction, the overall density of the plasma, a function of the temperature, and quantum properties of the particular atoms involved. We can rearrange the three equations above to eliminate all the variables except the input parameters and x. The long and short of all this is that we will then have a polynomial in x to a degree one higher than the highest ionization state. For hydrogen, we have a maximum ionization of one, so we get a quadratic. That's fine, possible to solve analytically. For helium, the maximum ionization is two, and we get a cubic, also doable. For lithium, we get a quartic, and so on for other elements. There is a further complication called continuum lowering when the plasma becomes very dense, as with an inertial fusion experiment or certain astrophysical objects. In short, when the density of free electrons becomes sufficiently high, they interact with atoms, making them easier to ionize. Mathematically, this means that the right-hand side of the Saha equation acquires a much more complicated function of x. The equation for the ionization fraction now becomes a truly transcendental equation, even for a pure hydrogen plasma. So let's take a step back for the moment. We have derived a function g of x, the root of which is the ionization fraction we want to know. Except for the cases of low-density hydrogen and helium, we can't find the roots analytically. Instead, we have to try different values of x until we find one sufficiently close to the root. The problem is that each function evaluation can take a long time. That's where Brent's method really shines, because it can find the root with a small number of function evaluations. Here is a curve of the ionization fraction for pure, solid density iron as a function of temperature, which I computed using Brent's method. Remember, iron has 26 electrons and the temperature has to rise to many millions of degrees before most atoms get fully ionized. This kind of situation would only occur in a very high density experiment or an iron-rich star or something like that. Normally, an iron plasma under these conditions would expand rapidly, lowering the density, and then the lower the density is in turn, the easier it is to ionize. Anyway, plasma physics aside, I hope you found this interesting. We looked at how Brent's method can be used to find the roots of functions, and therefore find inverse functions. Calculating the ionization fraction of a plasma is one application for this. Thank you for watching.